I'm a little sad. This is the end of our I Am series. Aww. I know. So we started out this series talking about knowing Jesus. And you remember we, we used Gavin. He came up here and we used him as an example and noticed the, noted, noted the difference between knowing someone and knowing about someone. And we saw how it's possible to know things about Gavin without really knowing him. And the same is true with Jesus. We can know things about him, but he wants us to know him personally, intimately, spending time with him and learning from him who he really is. So over the past seven weeks, that's what we've been doing. We've been spending time with Jesus, learning who he has revealed himself to us to be in these seven I am statements in the book of John. If you remember, the very words I am are significant to us because they show us that Jesus isn't just a good guy. He's not just a prophet. He is not just a ticket to heaven. Jesus is I am. That I am that revealed, the same I am that revealed himself to us in the Old Testament. He is Yahweh. He is the one who is. Yahweh reveals himself to us through the person of Jesus. In John 14, 7, Jesus says, if you know me, you'll know my father. And in John 10, 30, he says, I and the father are one. So God wants us to know him. And we know more about him, about who he is, by looking at the life and the teaching of Jesus. Throughout the book of John, Jesus said, I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the door, the good shepherd, the true vine, the way, the truth, and the life. And this week, our last one, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Life is 100% fatal. No one makes it out alive. Even Jesus had experiences with death. But he is the resurrection and the life, and he has power over death, as we're going to see in John chapter 11. If you have your Bible, you can turn there, or you can follow along on the screen. In John 11, verses 17 through 27, we see this, before this passage, we see that Jesus has been sent word from Mary and Martha, that their brother Lazarus, one of Jesus' dearest, closest friends, is sick. And when he heard the news, he told his disciples that this sickness would not end in death. No, this sickness would be used for God's glory. So Jesus stays where he is for about two more days, and then on the way to Judea, Jesus told his disciples that Lazarus had fallen asleep but he was gonna go and wake them up. They thought the sleep, you know, you need sleep to get better, right? They said, that's good, he'll get better. And then Jesus told them, no, Lazarus is dead. So let's pick up in John 11:17. 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Four days is pretty stinky. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been there, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again, in the resurrection at the last day. And here it is. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God who is to come into the world. So Lazarus had been dead for four days. 
and Jesus shows his power over death. And if you know the story, you know that he called Lazarus out of the grave. But what he did with Lazarus was not a resurrection. It was a resuscitation. He was brought back to life, the same as he was before. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Because the resurrection isn't an event, it's a person. It's Jesus. So Jesus, the resurrection and the life, has been a part of God's redemptive plan from the very beginning. When God created the world, when he created the the land and the sky and the sea and the plants and the animals, when God created the first humans, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, it was perfect. God loved those people so much. But love isn't love if it isn't free to choose. So God gives his people freedom to choose him, freedom to love him, freedom to follow him. In the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam and Eve one command. Don't eat the fruit of this one tree. And the people that God loved so much used their freedom to disobey him. And that sin separated us from God. Because of sin, death became a reality, a part of our story. In a meeting with Pastor Brian, he said this to me, your soul is infinitely valuable to God. Those words have been pulling on my heart and rattling around in my brain for two months. Your soul is infinitely valuable to God. Do you believe this? Because your soul is infinitely valuable to God, in his loving kindness, he shows us his mercy. He set in motion this plan to restore his people, to heal the world, to bring him and people back together and to conquer death. And that plan is written all throughout the pages of the Bible. Each story pointing to the one who would come, the one that Martha mentioned, who would come into the world, who would save the world, the Messiah Jesus. So this Friday, something special is happening. What do we call it? Good Friday. Friday. So on Good Friday, this is a day that we commemorate how Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, a price that we could never pay on our own. Jesus came down from heaven. He lived a perfect and sinless life, and it's his death on the cross that heals the separation between us and God. His sacrifice for us makes us right before God. We are forgiven because he died in our place. And then on Sunday, we will celebrate that Jesus who hung on the cross, was buried on Friday, rose from the grave. And unlike Lazarus, Jesus wasn't resuscitated He was resurrected. Jesus rose from the grave, a new glorified body. He was no longer confined to this world. His new body would never die again. This is resurrection, new life, the old gone. And because Jesus is the resurrection, he offers this new life to each of us when we choose to believe in him. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. So even though our bodies will die, our souls will live and never die because of Jesus. Do you believe this? 
Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's by believing in our heart that you are made right with God. And it's by openly declaring faith that you're saved. If you believe this, the resurrected, new, better, eternal life of Jesus is a gift to you. We follow a resurrected Jesus, but this is not a resurrected world. Not yet. There is sin, there is hurt, there is sickness, there's brokenness in this messy mess of a world. An unthinkable tragedy just right down the road. We've all felt the effects of living in a broken world. None of us escape it. But here's what I know is true. Jesus is making all things new. And one day, we're going to get a resurrected body. And we're going to live in a resurrected world. But we don't have to wait for one day for our souls. Because right now, our souls can receive the eternal life of the resurrected Jesus. Your soul is infinitely valuable to God. Your soul is infinitely valuable to God. He wants to resurrect your life now and forever. In John 17, 3, Jesus is praying to his father about this eternal life that he came to give. And he says, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's the life that Jesus wants for us. Jesus came to give us eternal life. Eternal life is to know Jesus. Do you believe this? It's going to feel like a really weird place to kind of cut some time off here, but um, I'm going to invite the band to come back up, and we're going to close in some worship, but we're going to do things a little bit differently. So for the first song, I want to invite you to stand, but I would like you to stay at your seats until I come back up. We're going to have just a time of prayer. We're just going to pray because you know what? I need prayer, and I'll bet that there are some other people in this room that need prayer too. Do you know Jesus? Do you want to know Jesus? Do you know him, but maybe your relationship has just gotten off track and you want to get back on track with him? You want to renew your commitment to him? Are you experiencing hurt or pain in your heart or in your body or in your relationships? Are you unsure about your future and need the Good Shepherd to guide you? Are there any sins that you are struggling with that you want to confess and walk away from? Are there any areas of your life that you need Jesus to resurrect? We would love to pray for you. No matter how big or how small this prayer request, we would love to pray with you. So let's just stay back at our chairs. Let's just sing this first song 
I'm going to come up about halfway through, and then I'm going to invite the leaders to stand around the room um, and just be ready to pray. And when you feel ready, um, just come on up, and, um, and we'll pray with you, all right? So let's, let's start off. I'll, I'll be back up to give you some more instructions.